is a machine? It has a tented structure that experiences intermittent compression. The flexibility of this structure increases as the foot collapses its posture. We think that the purpose of this collapse is to absorb or dampen impact and decrease rigidity to adjust to variable terrain. Extremely important to allow for propulsion off of natural surfaces that are inherently uneven. Postural collapse of the foot causes a poor foundation for human movement and propulsion. Although it may have a role in shock absorption and adaptation to irregular terrain, in excess, it is a major cause of foot, ankle, knee, hip, and back injuries in sports and in the general patient population. This postural collapse is the root cause of many foot and lower extremity pathologies. Postural collapse splays the forefoot and can cause a bunion or Taylor's bunion. Postural collapse elongates the foot, increasing the tension on the digital extensors, leading to hammer toe. Postural collapse tightens the transverse metatarsal ligament, compressing the nerve sheath, inducing a Morton's neuroma. Postural collapse increases the tension on the plantar fascia that can cause heel spurs and plantar fasciitis. Postural collapse can produce tears in the tibialis anterior, leading to shin splints. Postural collapse internally rotates the knee, increasing the cue angle, causing patellofemoral tracking disorder. We can trace the effects of postural collapse of the foot up the kinetic chain through the knees, hips, back, and neck. There are several ways postural collapse can be addressed. Certainly a rigorous exercise program, including some barefoot running, may be helpful for some patients. But compliance is generally poor and injury prevention may not result. Stretching and strengthening should always be a mainstay in the treatment program. Additionally, we propose to apply a corrective force with the use of a simple mechanical leaf spring, such as a foot orthotic. There are two basic ways of using such a spring under the arch. One way is to allow the foot to drop to near relaxed calcaneal stance posture, or completely collapsed, and then contact the orthotic. Two things are happening. The foot is slowing down as the ligaments tighten up. And the soft tissues on the bottom of the foot compress to dampen the impact. Orthotics then act like car bumpers. If you are going at low velocity, the bumper absorbs the impact and little or no damage is done to the car. At faster velocities, however, damage occurs in proportion to impact. This is why in the past, foot orthotics have made little or no kinematic changes in the foot. That is, changes in the way our feet move and function. At least 40 articles now confirm this. It is perplexing, however, that in spite of the minimal effect on movement patterns, significant symptomatic improvement is common. Three meta-analyses show that common foot orthotics done in the traditional podiatric sub tailor joint neutral technique and prefabricated over-the-counter orthotics, such as Dr. Scholl's, yield similar good results in masking symptoms. That's quite perplexing. No meaningful kinematic change, no change in injury rates, yet relief of symptoms. The answer may well be in Tom McPoyle's tissue stress theory. McPoyle et al. proposed that a symptom is simply when tissue stress from microtrauma occurs faster than a person's ability to heal. In other words, there is a tissue stress threshold. When ambulating during activities of daily living, or more aggressively in sports, 
some of the impact events exceed this threshold. When enough events cross the line, we get a symptom. Traditional orthotics use a selection of lumps, bumps, tilts, scives, grooves, flanges, and soft spots to move kinetic forces around the bottom of the foot to take pressure from one area to another. No attempt is made to control the motion because the corrective force is applied after the motion is almost complete. A different way to use a plastic leaf spring is to attempt to actually control the motion. That is, to apply the corrective force before the pathologic motion occurs, thus limiting the extent, decreasing the velocity, and delaying the onset of excessive postural collapse. That is the essence of mass posture. Mass could be thought of as the highest posture the foot can accept at mid-stance with the heel and forefoot on the ground. It applies a resistive force before pathologic motion occurs. This is a very aggressive approach to orthotic therapy. Certain questions must be answered to do this properly. How high should the plastic leaf spring be? Simply put, to control a motion, start at the beginning of that motion. Failure to do so will result in repetitive impact as the foot drops down and hits the orthotic. This impact will cause arch pain, which is usually misinterpreted as the arch is too high. In actuality, just the opposite is true. The arch is too low. If the foot was in full contact with the spring, there would be no impact. The foot does not have to drop down to hit the orthotic. It is already touching it. Unfortunately, most orthotics are cast with the foot off weight bearing and all the soft tissues round out. When a person wears a mass posture orthotic, the soft tissues will compress over seven millimeters in some areas that is huge in a foot orthotic. So it is important to cast the foot in such a way that will evenly compress the soft tissues. That is why a 1.75 pounds per square inch urethane foam is best. Unless of course your practice is limited to treating astronauts in zero gravity. Full contact Similar to full contact plaster casts, used to heal neurotrophic ulcers in diabetics, is another major tenet of mass posture. Full contact means no hot spots. In physics we say, there is an even pressure distribution, or force per unit area. The combination of no impact and full contact allows us to apply a relatively large corrective force without causing discomfort to the patient. So what is mass posture really? It is the shape of a plastic leaf spring to allow the application of an even corrective force at the beginning of the range of motion of postural collapse. It necessitates passage of weight through the foot in as close to an ideal gait cycle as possible while evenly compressing the soft tissues. Now comes the difficult problem. What is the correct spring constant? Or how hard should the leaf spring be? Isaac Newton answered that. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Before I can answer the question, how much force should this plastic leaf spring apply to the foot in a vertical direction, you must first tell me how much force you are applying downward on the foot orthotic. Downward force is a factor of three major variables. Body weight is the most important. 
How much greasy, sugary food do you eat? Foot flexibility is also a factor. If the ligaments are not helping support the arch, the spring has to apply a greater corrective force. If the foot is rigid, less corrective force is needed. The curvature of the foot in mass posture is also a factor. Resistance to compression equals the sum of the vertical components of the tangents to the curve. Lower curvatures have smaller vertical components than larger curvatures and therefore offer less resistance to compression. The third major factor is momentum, mass times velocity. Running over a force plate produces more vertical force than walking over it. This third factor is difficult. You may walk to the curb, notice it is raining, and run to your car. No one changes orthotics at the curb. Therefore, we must look at a range of forces we call ADL, or activities of daily living. Athletes have another range of forces that is particular to their sport we can call training and competing range. Athletes must often get a second pair for their sports calibrated to a different range of forces. What if a patient gains or loses weight? Weight loss can easily be accommodated with recalibration by removal of material. But weight gain requires a new set of orthoses because material can be readily removed but not added. Measuring the downward force is relatively easy with an F-scan or an E-Med system. But how do we measure the upward force of the orthotic? We use Pascal's law. Pressure inside an enclosed container is equivalent in all directions. We place the orthotics in a steel container, blow up a bladder over the orthotic and measure the pressure needed to move the orthotic every five hundredths of a millimeter. This yields a graph we call a force curve. The slope of that graph is the material's relative flexibility. We plot a scatter graph of the slopes of thousands of orthotics that worked well, holding body weight constant and varying foot flexibility, which yields one mathematical formula. Varying body weight holding foot flexibility constant yields another formula. Two algebraic equations can be solved for two variables. Now you have a formula. Given the body weight of the person and their foot flexibility, you can calculate the correct slope of the force curve for each individual. Originally we accomplished this with a single point. Now it is done with optics. This way we are looking at all points simultaneously. This gives us correct calibration 99.6% of the time. Now what we have is a full contact leaf spring calibrated to deliver an equal and opposite range of forces to the downward range of forces imposed by the body. That is a mass posture or thought. A new measurement question remained. There was no test that indicated how much a person will benefit from a foot orthotic. We know that proper posture will take stress off of many joints in the kinetic chain. But how much stress? Who needs mass correction and to what degree? We learned from Six Sigma that to improve something you must first be able to measure it. Or else how do you know it got better? Unfortunately, the measurements that podiatrists were taking have been proven to have poor inter-rater reliability. This study and 11 others have shown that of the 17 measurements that podiatrists take in their static biomechanical exam, 
15 have an inter-rater reliability of 0.5 or less, and the remaining two only 0.6, still clinically meaningless. Some suggested biomechanical x-rays, but they were taken full weight bearing, thus in the worst possible posture the foot can attain, therefore only giving us the extent of the deformity, telling us nothing about the corrected posture. We needed a way of comparing the best and worst postures of the foot. It is simple trigonometry. What changes as the foot collapses? If we look at the angle made between the horizontal plane and the inclination of the calcaneus, or heel, in both corrected and uncorrected postures, we see changes in two important variables. The opposite side of that angle which is the lever arm of the plantar fascial force and the adjacent side of that angle. Opposite over adjacent is tangent. A ratio of the tangents of these angles yields two important calculated values. The percentage change in work that the plantar fascia has to do when the posture is left alone as compared to mass or corrected posture and the percentage reduction in tension that will occur as the foot goes from uncorrected to corrected posture. The Soul Supports LA Angle app is born. Finally, there is a test to show how much a person will benefit from correction of their collapsed foot posture. In other words, who will benefit from a foot orthotic and who will not? Anecdotal evidence shows that various diagnoses can be reversed or avoided with mass posture correction. We postulate that the functional correction of mass posture could serve as both a treatment and a preventive modality, thus helping the clinician make the best possible decision for the patient. Soul Supports. We make people better. Thanks for watching.